Welcome to uh, UK PGI um, webinars this evening. Um, I'm uh, Andrew Toms, I'm in Exeter, um, and uh, I welcome you to a, a series of webinars that the UK group are going to be running. Um, our audience is somewhere between 600 uh, to 700 people from as far afield as New Zealand, uh, Glasgow, Cardiff, and uh, our uh, speaker this evening from, from the state. The UK PGI group was formed really on the back of the inspiration and enthusiasm that was generated by those of us who were at the international consensus meeting in Philadelphia. And uh, we came back um, and had our first meeting in Cardiff in January 2009. Um, which was really 2019, which was really looking at um, practical application of what we'd learnt in, in Philadelphia. Um, the second meeting we had was in Birmingham, organised by Lee Jays. And this third meeting was supposed to be uh, in Glasgow uh, going on this month uh, under uh, the auspices of Dominic Meek and the Glasgow team. Unfortunately, this has obviously been um, cancelled due to um, COVID. Um, and as such, the Glasgow team have put on this excellent series of webinars. Um, so, so this first one, then another one on the 27th of May, one on the 30th of September, and one on the 25th of November. And thank you to David and Bill, particularly for the amount of hard work they've put into this. Um, UK PGI isn't just a group of knee and hip surgeons, uh, it is microbiologists, uh, ID doctors, uh, and all of those who are really involved with and care for these uh, unfortunate patients. The educational sessions um, uh, that we've run from the UK PGI um, have been at the uh, our, our National Congress, the BOA, and have included um, infection in, in the foot and ankle, world as well as um, upper limb as they start to grapple with um, these difficult clinical dilemmas. As the UK bone and joint infection registry has become more established uh, and become uh, a, an increasingly used resource in the UK, um, the, the UK PGI group have uh, really teamed up with our banner um, and become the educational and meeting um, arm of the, the registry, which you'll hear a little bit more about in one of the other webinars. So throughout this um, series, we're going to um, put up some questions. Now, these questions aren't as a test. Uh, you won't be identified as below par if you fail them. Uh, this is particularly relevant for Ridian. Um, uh, and throughout this series, it's really for us just to try and establish areas of interest, uh, areas of enthusiasm, and, and where the educational demand is for future meetings. Um, and uh, I think Dave is going to share those questions, and I'm going to hand over to my uh, highly esteemed and senior colleague, uh, Ridian Morgan-Jones, who is in Cardiff at the moment. Over to you, Rid. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, as ever, a wonderful introduction. I get older every time I hear you speak. <laughs> so uh, we'd go through the first uh, tranche of questions just very quickly now. So David, could we share, please? Yeah, the first one's up. First one's up. Um, okay. So I can't see these questions. I can see them if you want. Yeah, Andy, would you take over? So, so the first question is, do you routinely use any diagnostic criteria in the diagnosis of PGI. So in your clinical practice, uh, do you routinely use diagnostic criteria in the diagnosis of PGI? That's a yes or, or a no question. That's obviously fairly self-explanatory. And then the next question, which is linked to that, obviously, is, is what do you use? Uh, so do you use the 2011 criteria, uh, the 2013 criteria, uh, the 2018 um, ICM criteria, the recently published um, European Infection Group criteria, or do you have some other criteria that you, um, that you use yourself? And if you could all just click on uh, those um, boxes, um, we will be able to show you the results at the end as we go through. 
Um, I, I promise that Jay won't be given anybody's names and addresses to, to chase down afterwards. And we've got a message from uh, Pedro in Coventry saying you can't see the questions. About 70% of people have voted so far, so um, we we'll try relaunching once that kind of levels off a bit here. And we'll give it another 10 seconds, then we move on to the second question, and I've got them up my screen here. So should we go to the second transfer questions? Um, yeah, would you like to see the, the results of the first poll? Oh, yes, please. Okay. So we've got 83% routinely using diagnostic criteria. And ICM 2018 is the leading uh, method. So Jay, I think you'd be very pleased with that. All of us. I think all of us would be very pleased. Excellent. So the next uh, series of questions, please, David. I'll assume they're on the screen because I can't quite see them, but number one, do you agree with the diagnostic threshold? There we go. Of CRP greater than 10 milligrams per liter for chronic PGI? Again, yes or no. So greater than 10 milligrams per liter CRP. Number two, do you agree with a diagnostic threshold for synovial white blood cells greater than 3,000 cell cells per microliter? Yes or no? And do you agree with the chronic, the diagnostic threshold for synovial polymorphic nucleosides of greater than 80% for chronic PGI? Yes or no? And David, when we've got 70% plus answered, we can probably show that. Almost there now. And I missed the fourth question on the screen. Do you agree with an ESR threshold of greater than 30 milligrams per litre? Yes or no? Okay, David, show us the results. Great, so there's quite significant agreement across the board here, which is pleasing. Good, that's great. I think we can probably close, close the session now, can we? Yeah, brilliant. There will be some more questions uh, at the end. And again, these are markers for us uh, to look at what we're going to research in future, what educational needs we bring to you all in future. But now it's time for Andrew and I to be quiet and to have the main speaker of the evening. Uh, Professor Javid Pavizi is, I think, without any doubt, the leading expert worldwide when it comes to prosthetic joint infection. And that comes off the back of many years of very hard research, but also very hard education. You know, Jay is one of the most prolific lecturers you'll see on the international circuit and he's never been known to turn down an invitation and we're absolutely delighted you can make it this evening Jay. Jay is the director of clinical research at the Rothman Institute in Philadelphia which hosted the international consensus meeting in 2013 and 2018. He's the professor of orthopedics at Thomas Jefferson University. Although I see here tonight representing the states we feel he was made in the UK having gone to Sheffield Medical School and been tutored by that well-known uh, surgeon, Ian Stockley. Uh, Ian has taken credit for all Jay's work ever since. Uh, Jay, it's a <laughs> pleasure to have you. Um, and we're all looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Redeem, for a very kind introduction. I, uh, yeah, my claim to fame is that I was uh, Ian Stockley's uh, house officer, uh, which is incredible. And it's been an incredible, as you know, I'm British uh, 
trained. I love my connections to Britain. I still continue to admire amazing scholars like yourself, Andrew, and all the others that are on this call. And David, thank you so much for the opportunity to get this webinar together. Uh, Ridian and Andrew asked me to just give a quick update, maybe 30 minutes or so. Uh, what I will do is I will go over some of these developments related to prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. We have some to you, and uh, we can then, of course, have the um, question and answer session. We all uh, know that infection obviously is a terrible problem. It leads to issues like this that are uh, awful for our patients leads to high morbidity and uh, unfortunately loss of limbs and at times loss of lives. We and others have uh, studied this subject. Infection is actually a killer. The risk of dying um, from a revision is four times higher if the uh, underlying diagnosis was periprosthetic joint infection. And the five years uh, survivorship from PJI is actually similar to some of these common cancers. And this is a graph from one of our previous, uh, previous publications. And in terms of its burden and morbidity is actually higher than some very, very serious uh, uh, surgeries like kidney transplant or coronary artery disease. Very, uh, very uh, high gravity indeed. And we just recently finished another analysis with Werner Zimmerli from Swe uh, Switzerland and also Steve Kurtz looking at the Medicare data, and we actually found that the mortality has decreased slightly over time. Incidence of PJI still continues to be very high, and the five-year survivorship is actually similar to breast cancer and prostate cancer. Infection is unfortunately on the rise. Now is the number one failure in the American Joint Registry, registry and it's actually number one by miles uh, compared to the others. The burden has been on an exponential curve, as we've talked about before. In 2019, there were 62,000 uh, uh, infections. I just got that number recently. I didn't have it for 2018, but this is what it was in 2017. So you can see it continues to increase, both because of the prevalence as well as the incidence. And the cost, at least in the United States, is very high, and I'm sure it's no exception to NHS. So what about the developments? On the prevention front, and by the way, everything that I talk about is mostly highlighted in the ICM Philly app. And many of you were uh, delegates that contributed to this incredible work. Uh, I wanna thank all of you again. This app is free to download, both for iOS as well as Android. And if you look, it has multiple sub apps like PGI DX, which we will talk about. There is a risk calculator. And now we even have a calculator for success of DARE, if you're ever in doubt, you can put those metrics and we'll give you an idea as to what the success for DARE may be. On the uh, preventative side, antibiotics still continue to be important. Optimization of patients, the OR traffic, OR um, ventilation system, and also maybe some antiseptic irrigation solution like COVID-19. Uh, WHO published their recommendations. If you don't have access to it, please let me know and I'll be happy to email this one to you. The CDC also published their recommendations and this was an evidence-based activity, which I was part of. Um, we dug into evidence and tried to come up with recommendations uh, based on evidence as much as possible. But as many of you know, unfortunately, much of what we know is based on thin science. And the CDC did um, uh, state that the number of unresolved issues in these guidelines uh, reveal substantial gap that uh, warrant future research. Fortunately, NIH and other funding bodies in the United States have put a lot of weight behind these issues. And now we're seeing more and more funding going towards infection, which will be great. You're all aware of the international consensus meeting that gathered together to try to come up with recommendations in the presence and absence of some of this evidence, which has been published and again, it's in that app. So one of the things that you will find from these guidelines that are emerging shows that antibiotics are not the holy grail. In fact, uh, see here that only one dose of antibiotics should be given to patients undergoing clean contaminated surgery and joint replacement happens to be one of them. So one dose being one that patient receives prior to skin incision and no further afterwards. 
there is a study that's ongoing in the United States, and we will have an answer to, uh, to whether one dose is enough or 24 hours of antibiotics need to be administered. CDC is against the idea of uh, adding any type of antibiotic powders to the incision, uh, any type of ointments to the uh, skin, or dressings with antimicrobials in them. And the reason for this is really the rise of antimicrobial resistance, or in particular, escape organisms, which unfortunately will be a major issue. This particular uh, graph is actually from a British uh, work group that was commissioned by the British Parliament to look into the issue of AMR. And they found that the number of people that will die of antimicrobial resistance will be higher than cancer by the year 2050. So a real major issue, and uh, this AMR happens to be one of the problems. And that's why CDC and others are sort of moving away from antibiotics towards the use of antiseptics, antimicrobials. I personally use povidine iodine, for example. I don't put vancomycin or any antibiotics in the wound. And it's recommended that these antiseptic solutions should be used. Diabetes has gained huge attention in recent years, obviously because of the fact that it's so rife. As you know, American Diabetes Association recommends that any uh, hemoglobin A1C greater than 7% is indicative of um, uh, uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, we did a research to show a correlation between hemoglobin A1C and infection rates. And as you can see over here, there was an exponential rise in the incidence of infection when the level of hemoglobin A1C was beyond 7.7. So my institution has a cutoff of 8% for hemoglobin A1C. But as you all know, hemoglobin A1C has a limitation because it relies on 120 day life cycle of the red blood cell. In recent years, there have been searched for other markers that are one more accurate and two have a faster turnover Fructosamine is one of them, which is glycated albumin or prealbumin. And in fact, there's actually a now a test called glycated albumin or GA, which apparently is much more widely available because I know in United Kingdom, for example, fructosamine is not widely available uh, test. So I think we're going to see uh, quite a few of these studies come out. We just published our fructosamine experience in the scientific reports that just came out a couple of weeks ago. And we are in the middle of a randomized study to look at the uh, correlation between glycemia and GA, gly uh, glycated album. So a lot more on the prevention side, but please know that there's those that are proven to be effective strategies and others, they may not be effective. On the diagnosis front, diagnosis still remains very difficult. Any type of implant-related infections are very difficult to diagnose, one, because of the formation of biofilm, and two, because of internalization of organisms into the bone canaliculi, as you will see down here, these yellow fast dividing bodies are staph aureus inside the bone canaliculi that continue to invade, and then they destroy these purple-looking cells, which are uh, multinucleated neutrophils. Neutrophils have absolutely no chance of eliminating these bacteria, and that's what happens. And the uh, cell up here, the blue one in uh, label B, is an osteoblast that uh, shows an internalized staph aureus. So it doesn't matter how much you ream, unfortunately, this bone will still continue to harbor the organisms. And that is really the whole purpose or the whole issue behind the osteomyelitis. Diagnosis. Uh, there isn't any gold, no gold standard, and uh, I don't believe there will ever be one. There will be like one test that will diagnose. Medicine is full of these uh, situations where a single test for diagnosis is not available. Depression, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, et cetera, et cetera. There is no ankylosing spondylitis. Numerous of these conditions, they just don't have a single criterion for diagnosis and hence that's why we rely on multiple of these criteria. In 2011, as I was approaching the presidency of the MSI, so I realized there were too many definitions available. You would pick up a paper, would uh, rely on one definition and another paper would rely on another. So we tried to standardize this and that's why in 2011, the, di the diagnostic criteria by MSIS was uh, introduced, which was fortunately working well um, but unfortunately, it looks like we're going in the opposite direction again. And now there's a huge number of diagnostic criteria that have been introduced. 
And by the way, the ICM 2013 was really just a slightly modified definition of 2011 MSIS. 2018 ICM criteria is a slight modification of the 2013 uh, diagnostic criteria. But in 2018, we brought in the scores uh, for the um, diagnostic criteria. It's the only criteria that's actually evidence-based, is validated by multi-institutional data, and it's a stepwise approach. It gives a score to each of these tests because the diagnostic odds ratio of elevated ESR is not the same as PMM percentage. Some people um, will mislead you by telling you that the diagnostic criteria of 2018 expects you to have alpha defensin level measured. That's not true at all. If you don't have alpha defensin, you, uh, you will be able to make the diagnosis. In fact, if you have alpha defense and that's abnormal and white blood cell is elevated, that person still gets three points. And there are recent papers published showing that the elevated synovial white blood cell is just as accurate as alpha defense. So there's definitely no need to do the alpha defense. And the other criticism I've heard is that people say that we're trying to push for a test that we, discuss, we described at Rothman, namely D-dimer. Again, you don't have to have the D-dimer to make this diagnostic criteria at all. If the D-dimer has been done and C-reactive protein is done and either of them are elevated, you get two points. If both of them are elevated, you still get two points. So it's not like you have to have these tests done. And I know people say, well, the numbers are difficult to add, et cetera, but there's an app for it. And this new diagnostic criteria is actually better than the MSIS criteria in picking some of these innocuous and slow growing infections that have continued to produce problem. The PGIDX app that's inside the ICM Philly adds these up for you and will give you a score. If it's three or less, it's definitely not infected. If it's six or greater, it's definitely infected. If it's four and five, that's inconclusive and it will guide you to do further tests or repeat the tests that you've done in order to get to that real uh, scenario. Better methods for diagnosis are needed. In particular, I think we need serum markers. Us, as well as many other uh, organizations and institutions have been working for those serum markers. This is a whole list of serum markers that we have been exploring. And recently we have stumbled across alpha-2 macroglobulin. Fibrinogen was described by the Chinese investigators as a very valuable one. We have been interested in D-dimer. IP10 is another promising one that should hopefully be uh, published fairly soon. The, uh, as you know, medicine is moving towards the use of microfluidics. That's when you really have very, very small volume of body fluid, whatever it may be, including blood, which will allow you to perform a whole host of extensive tests to be able to get to the diagnosis. And microfluidics are being used all over. Just here's an example of microfluidics of DNA for malaria disease that WHO has uh, introduced and is being used across the third world. Molecular techniques are going to replace or at least supplement the culture techniques that are very old and outdated. In particular, I think metagenomics and next generation sequencing will become very promising technologies in the future. And this has uh, been explored in urology, for example. A very interesting paper showed that when you treat the urinary tract infection based on the NGS signal, versus culture, the outcome was much better. It's been explored in neurological field as well as cardiothoracic field. Again, much better results when NGS signal was treated. Culture negative infections still continue to cause quite a bit of issue for us. As you've seen, this was one of the questions that was discussed during the consensus. And the incidence of culture negative is actually 40% in my institution right now. The incidence really depends on what diagnostic criteria you use and what type of microbiological processes you have in place. But the numbers are very high. And as you can see here, uh, the consensus was very strongly in favor of using alternative methods for diagnosis of uh, culture negative infections and isolation of the infective organism. My first encounter with next generation sequencing was uh, when I actually had one of my own patients who had a knee down four years earlier, wife called me, told me he's got a swollen knee. Patient went to another institution, they aspirated him, pus was poured out of his joint and then came to us, we couldn't really identify. And then 
when we are then uh, uh, centered for next generation sequencing, Streptococcus canis was isolated. And as it happens, this, this person's knee had been actually scratched and licked by their pet dog, which was the cause of transferring that particular organism to the uh, knee. A multi-center study just finished and the results will be coming out very soon. Next generation sequencing appears to isolate the organisms in 90% of culture negatives. Next generation sequencing is showing us the majority of these infections are polymicrobial and culture isolates only the dominant organism. And when you actually ignore signal like this one, E. coli, they can come back and cause an infection down the line. And that shouldn't be really surprising. This is Bonnie Bassler, the uh, microbiologist from Princeton who coined the term uh, quorum sensing and she's done incredible amount of work in this particular TED talk, she talks about how bacteria exist in a community. They never operate alone. So getting infected by Staph aureus doesn't mean that Staph aureus is the only organism in that joint. It just means Staph aureus is orchestrating that particular clinical scenario. So if you ignore the NGS signal, your patient could pay a price by being infected later down the line. Thanks to the declining cost of genomics, uh, we're now able to do human genome in a day at $150 versus 13 years at 3 billion. That's why numerous companies have sprung up that can do the genomics. And I think the genomics will definitely be the way of the future. On treatment front, we are seeing a lot emerge on uh, microbiome. I think this is a very, very hot science and hot topic. That's basically the relationship between the 100 trillion microbial cells that live in our body with 37 trillion human cells, three microbes to every cell in our body. And for the most part, they live in harmony and equilibrium. But if that um, particular equilibrium gets disturbed or a state of dysbiosis arises, then a disease condition surfaces. And this is just a list of all the disease uh, diseases that have been described as a result of dysbiosis recently. And talking of dysbiosis, it's very important for us to recognize that discrete microbiome exists in our uh, joints. Uh, shoulder was described by the Canadian team. We've looked at it in the hip and the knee, and I won't bore you with the details, but you can see a huge number of organisms in the joint can exist, and some of them are actually pathogens. And given the right environment, they could turn into a pathogen and cause the issue. Don't uh, dispel the dysbiosis and the influence it plays in human lives. Remember the story of Barry Marshall and Robin Warren who were scrutinized and ostracized with uh, their, uh, uh, their theory that peptic ulcer disease was caused by Helicobacter pylori. And 20 years later, they received the Nobel Prize. We need to learn from them and from other fields of medicine because there are quite a lot of these problems that happens. We need to learn that there is a parallel between cancer and infectious diseases. Microbes communicate in exactly the same way as the cancer cells do. And in recent years, we've seen a, a human biome immune system interactions. This is a very complex slide. I'm just giving you a little teaser about some of the incredible emerging sciences that shows how important microbiome is in causing diseases and in particular in eliminating infections. We've seen that uh, administration of probiotics, bacillus, uh, was very effective in eliminating Staph aureus in the gut of uh, Thai volunteers. This is Michael Otto's work from NIH that was published in Nature. And now in recent years, we are seeing the Trojan horse or so-called the translocation theory. This is when the neutrophils will carry the microbes to a distant site from the site of infection and result in a problem. So the hematogenous spread of bacteria from the tooth abscess to a knee of a patient may happen as a result of this translocation of the Trojan horse hypothesis. Fascinating, a lot's being done in the field of cardiology. And I think this is a field that requires exploration by young men and women who are hopefully attending this uh, conference. Um, a great British discovery was the phage therapy. This is Frederick Twart in the British Army in 1915 discovered the phage. And uh, phage was actually the main therapy until 1940s when penicillin was discovered. It unfortunately went out of use. 
but it had it still continued to be used in the military to some extent and a few countries in particular georgia continued to do phage therapy in fact there is a phage center in tbilisi and uh, phage therapy is coming back phages are very very important these are viruses that kill the bacteria on our body and if we don't have phages our body would be swarming with bacteria we would not be able to even live and in recent years, there have been this discovery of um, lysins. So what happens with the phage is phage comes and attaches itself to the bacterial wall, injects the uh, uh, DNA into the cell of the bacterium. Then the DNA replicates producing the viruses. And this is, by the way, how COVID works as well. And these viruses then start to produce uh, lysins. These are these orange enzymes, as you see. And then these lysins will result in lysis of the cell wall and the, and the escape of the intracellular uh, uh, machinery and death of bacterium. And right now there is actually a French company that's exploring the use of lysins for the treatment of peripocytic joint infection. I've had experience of using phage in very, very uh, severe infections where we were unable to eradicate them with use of conventional methods. And uh, licenses are being actually um, uh, evaluated by FDA and phage therapy may soon be also approved by FDA for multi-resistant organisms. And these are some of the licenses in development and in pipeline. So I think what, uh, what I will do is actually I will... Um, uh, I, I will stop there, and I wanted to also tell you a little bit about um, the um, little bit about the uh, development in the UK and the US. Two randomized prospective studies are ongoing. That's evaluating one stage versus two stage. We're seeing one stage gain real popularity in the United States, thanks to those of you coming from Europe to uh, to tell us about the benefits of one stage. So I think we will be moving more and more towards it. Novel therapeutics are in development. That in itself is a huge talk, and I'll be happy to send you information about these. In particular, surface modification is gaining real momentum. And of the surface modification, nanotechnology or nanotubules is really becoming very uh, exciting um, uh, development. I know at least four companies that are working on nanotubule modification of the titanium surface. The nanotubules are actually a, a lesson learned from, less, uh, from nature. This is a dragonfly's wing, apparently has extremely small nanotubules that pierces the bacteria anytime bacteria tries to attach itself to the surface. And we have seen this as well as chitosan, which is the outer shell of insects, all having antibacterial properties. And these will become very promising if we are able to produce these nanopillars on the surface of our implants that will prevent bacterial adhesion. At that point, I think it would be a, an incredible accomplishment. Again, if you are interested in learning more about uh, the uh, PGI, please download this app. On a weekly basis, we also highlight a paper, all these recent developments, so you'll re receive a notification of uh, what paper is being uh, advertised. Uh, I will... Uh, I will stop there and I'm grateful to all of you for, uh, uh, for listening to me. And um, I would also like to highlight the fact that uh, there is uh, uh, this whole series that are being conducted by, um, by the Glasgow group. I am grateful to have the opportunity to do it. And uh, you can see on May 27th, there will be another one that will be uh, given by uh, Martin McNally and uh, Matt Scarborough. Thank you very much, and I will stop there. Jay, that was a masterclass. Thank you so much. Um, as ever, you know, when I've heard you talk a few times around the world, and you always bring up something new, something exciting. So thank you so much. Um, we've got a few questions coming in, and while I collate them, perhaps, Andrew, we could go through a couple more poll questions. Yeah, OK. So, uh, David, do you want to bring up um, two questions that you've got there. Uh, I hope everyone can see that. So the first question is, how long do you routinely keep cultures for in your unit? <clears throat> how long do you routinely keep cultures for in your, your unit? Less than five days. 
five to 14 days and over 14 days. And then the second question touched uh, on that area that, uh, that Jay alluded to, which is a real difficult area, is the suspected culture negative PGIs. Um, should cultures be maintained for 14 days or longer? So should they be maintained for 14 days, yes or no? Um, uh, and uh, and Jay, um, we're going to come to you with a with a series of um, of questions, some of which are from the panelists, and uh, some of which are from Ridian um, and I. David, when you've got the answers for those two questions, do you want to ping them up quickly, and we can ask Jay to just clarify some of those areas for us. So the answer was, how long do you routinely keep cultures for um, in your unit? So most units are obviously five to 14 days, 20% being over 14 days. And in suspected culture negative PGI, uh, should cultures be maintained for, for 14 days or longer? Jay, what's the, um, what's the real answer? And I know what we all do on the background of dogma and of what we've been taught and the way, certainly in the UK, that the micro labs are set up but where do you where do you stand particularly on the culture negative um, area yeah yeah great thank you andrew yeah on the culture negative i would be inclined to keep the culture for at least 14 days and possibly 21 because the longer you keep it the more likely you are to isolate the organism in particular slow growing organism like c acne or even some of these mycobacteria and crinobacteria cocheria some of these organisms for sure and one of the attendees asks about the enrichment medium. It's also very important in the culture medium, I'm sorry, in culture negative infection, you do the following steps. One is transfer the synovial fluid in pediatric blood culture bottles and not just in uh, any of these plastic tubes. Two, call the lab and tell them you're sending them very sensitive uh, material and please process this material as uh, soon as possible. Three, ask them to actually use an enriched medium in the lab also, um, and also look for atypical organisms like mycobacteria and fungi. If you did this, you could potentially bring the culture negative rate down by a few percentage point. But despite all our efforts, we still continue to see a fair number of culture negative infections and the question that arises, as you just highlighted, Andrew, is what do you do with the culture negatives? You know, what antibiotic do you administer them to them? And do you cover both gram negative and gram positive? Do you cover fungi? Do you cover atypical uh, mycobacteria, et cetera? So I just don't think in 21st century, with the science where it is, it is acceptable for us to sit in a room and tell the patient that I'm going to yank out these well-fixed components in your joint and by the way, I don't even know which organism is causing your infection. It's just not acceptable. That's great. So what pragmatic choices do you, do you make if you've genuinely got a uh, culture negative um, uh, patient? You know, what's your, what's your clinical algorithm and antibiotic um, best guess? So, uh, yeah, at this point, fortunately, the next generation sequencing has helped us immensely uh, and we have a series of very atypical organisms that causes these infections. And I'm sure both you and uh, Ridian have seen some of these organisms that I've never heard of that causes the infection. On the ones that are still negative, if it's the patients, uh, if these patients that have had complex history and they've had multiple infections and they've had multiple operations, we definitely cover them for gram negative and gram positive. And if we are, we are suspicious of fungus, we actually also administer six weeks of an antifungal agent to them as well. So Jake, can I pick you up on that point? Because I think um, more of an issue for me and possibly for yourself is not the cut negatives in the sense you grow nothing, but when you have polymicrobial infections and you've only grown one when there's a couple others who are subcultures that then become dominant because they're not going to be treated. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good point, Riddy. And right now, based on the data that I've seen emerge from the multi-center study, 
and experience that our ID doctors have had at uh, Jefferson Rothman here, we treat the entire polymicrobial community. Fortunately, most of the time, a single antibiotic will get majority of them, but there are circumstances like I showed on that slide when there's E. coli signal, we will add a, a, a amine glycoside or maybe even something like ciprofloxacin, et cetera, to cover that gram negative as well. I don't know what you're doing right now with the polymicrobials. Are you uh, treating them all or are you just treating them do the dominant? Yeah, so I, I would tend to be much more, much broader in antibiotic coverage until my late cultures have come through. And I, I'm very reluctant to narrow the field too soon. So I tend to go much broader from probably longer than most. And I al almost always do dual therapy. Uh, again, that seems a little bit of a uh, difference to yourself where you may be dual therapy is for the exceptional cases. Yeah. Okay, a uh, couple of easy questions, Jay. Uh, where can the guys download the I ICM Philly app from? Oh, from Apple Store, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah just go online and you do for um, Apple phones and for Microsoft. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And then it's available for both free of charge, obviously. If you put ICM Philly, it should bring it up. Brilliant, and another Quick question, uh, what, what patients, it's about op optimization, what patients will you not operate on until they are improved? Yeah, okay, so I will tell you the absolute no-no are the following. Patient who's obviously not an anesthesia candidate, either they are dependent on O2 uh, room, uh, at room oxygen, uh, patients who have a cardiac, uh, unstable cardiac condition, obviously pulmonary, et cetera. Now put the medical aside, from our point of view, patients that have active infection in their joint will not get a joint replacement. They will obviously get a spacer. Patients that have diabetes that's uncontrolled and uh, hemoglobin A1C above eight would really make me worried and I would not. There is a cutoff for BMI in my institution of 40. I realize that's not based on any science, but there is some form of a cutoff. But if obesity is combined with hypertension, hyperglycemia, and dyslipidemia, so-called metabolic syndrome, we don't operate on them until they are uh, optimized. Patients who are immunocompromised with very, very low white cell counts of like two or under, uh, on chemotherapeutic agents, et cetera, they will not get an elective surgery. Those are only for emergencies. And patients who have very bad skin condition that appears to be infected, either a discrete ulcer in the extremity or ulcers in any parts of their body, they would also not, they will also be turned down. Thanks, thanks, Jay. That's that's really helpful. Um, so we've got uh, two two questions for you here. One is um, uh, from one of the delegates. Um, in immunocompromised patients like uh, rheumatoid, presumably having primary replacement surgery, who are on steroids or, or methotrexate or biologics, what uh, what's the consensus on uh, antibiotics? Um, perioperatively, uh, do, you, do you continue that? Do you give them longer cover or do you stick with the, with the one shot philosophy? Right, so we would not operate on a patient who's on disease modifying biological agent. Metatrexate is not a biological agent nor is steroids. So we would actually proceed with surgery on those patients. And that's probably why your, your attendees asking the question. In that group of patients, we would incline to cover them for 24 hours. And sometimes, Andrew, we give a consideration to giving a dual antibiotic. Most of our patients go home by 24 hours anyway. The question is whether you should extend the course of antibiotics by an oral agent after discharge from the hospital. There was a research paper published recently by Michael Maneghini that shows seven days of oral antibiotics reduces the risk of infection. I would be very careful about that type of a study because that was not prospective. There is no control arm. The follow-up is short, et cetera. So Mike Mangini will be the first one to tell you. Uh, but again, having been uh, brainwashed by CDC regarding the dangers of extended antibiotic treatment, I would say that 24 hours is fine for that group of patients. 
yeah, that's really that's really helpful. And and on a on a research base um, front, um, given the difficulty with diagnosis and the lack of a gold standard and the presence of so many confounders at almost every stage of treatment from dare through to two stage um how are we going to generate uh, the evidence and the answers um from from trials yeah and again that was as you know andrew one of the issues we discussed during the consensus uh, we had a workshop uh, with the FDA on the 14th of November, FDA is coming to realize that insisting on full-blown clinical trial to prove an anti-infective technology is perhaps impractical. So there are some changes at the regulatory uh, uh, stage for, uh, for allowing assessment of these anti-infective technologies. But even for us to sort of look at the uh, you know, I don't know, the effect of laminar flow on infection rate, whether that does or does not work. As you said, we're, we're looking at, you know, 20, 20, 30,000 uh, uh, patients. So your question is an extremely timely one, and I will be happy to send a copy of a paper that I just wrote with Paul Tornetta on how to prove the worth of anti-infective technologies or protocols. Um, and there is a huge number of suggestions in that particular paper, which includes assessment and high-risk patient population, utilizing surrogate markers for evaluation, et cetera. So I can certainly send a copy of that paper to David, and David could perhaps circulate to people if they wish. But you're absolutely right. If we're going to go uh, down the path of making any difference to our patients' lives, we cannot uh, possibly... Uh, do studies that requires 30,000 patients. They're just not doable. Thank you. That's really helpful. A few quick questions from the uh, the delegates. Jay, if you've, got, if you've still got a voice. Um, so antibiotic prophylaxis for a primary joint replacement is a single dose enough? Yes, it is. If the patient is healthy. We published a paper in JBJS. It's a retrospective series. So I, um, I would take that with a little bit of caution. We looked at the patients that are done as an outpatient basis. I don't know if that's gaining traction in uh, UK or not, but in here about 30 to 40 percent of joint replacements are now being done on an outpatient basis. They go home the same day. They are not around to receive the 24 hours of uh, antibiotics. So we looked at the infection rate in that group of patients versus a group of patients that did receive 24 hours. We matched them. Because you know you might say, yeah, yeah, of course, the outpatient patients are healthier and younger, and that's true. But we did match them to younger and healthier patients who received the 24 hours, and we didn't see difference. American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons has sponsored a very, very large scale uh, study that you know, Andrew, you were just talking about. It's a 4,000 patients strong, and Duke Group are in uh, the final throes of this. And they've had at least 1,400 patients uh, registered. The interim data that they presented to us recently showed no difference between one dose intravenous antibiotic versus three doses. So based on that and based on our experience, I am, I am well, we're, doing, we're actually recruiting for that particular study right now. But if that's, I think one dose is enough, I would say yes. Great answer. Thank you. Another quick one. Uh, this time from uh, my fellow Uma Youssef, who I'm going to shout out. He's a good lad. Um, vitamin D. Is there any evidence that preoperative vitamin D levels can indicate the risk of infection post surgery? Is it? Uh, are we talking about the D dimer or no, vit vitamin oh, D? Oh, vitamin D. I'm so sorry. Vitamin D. Yeah, yeah. Great question. Obviously, your fellow is reading the literature. And um, there is quite a bit, and you know, uh, you, you all know, there's been quite a bit that's been published recently about the influence of vitamin D on a lot of infections. And in fact, there's quite a bit on COVID, actually. Uh, so the answer is yes, actually, there is a correlation. Patients who are vitamin D deficient have a higher risk for infection. And the me mechanism has also been worked out to do with macrophages, neutrophil migration, et cetera. Yes. Yes. So, and particularly in a lovely sunny country like Britain, you should really worry about your vitamin D deficient patients. So 
I think it's important to try to supplement their vitamin D and try to address that beforehand. But as you would know, Redian, there are three issues. One is, should you be screening everybody for vitamin D? And if so, what would the incidence be? Incidence in the United uh, States in some parts of the country, like Midwest and uh, uh, Upper North, is around 30%. The second is which of the components of measurements uh, should you rely on? One, uh, one uh, OH, 125 OH, or the vitamin three to floating. That is an evolving science. But the third and the most important part of it is that to address vitamin D deficiency is actually not that easy. You would need to do like 50 to 500,000 units a day, and they would still take quite a while for these patients to get their vitamin D back to normal. But I think vitamin D supplementation is probably a great idea. It is cheap, it is effective. And in my opinion, if you ask me, every patient undergoing surgical procedure should have nutritional supplementations that does include some form of vitamin D. I'm sorry about the long debate, but it's, uh, I just, I, I think that's very, very good question coming from a fellow because that's an area that's really expanded. Yeah, Jay, we're gonna keep going until you can't answer a question. <laughs> so, Jay, there's a couple, couple more questions here about um, antibiotics. One which I think is, is probably on everybody's um, uh, agenda is um, antibiotic treatment duration, um, particularly in DARE um, or in one or two stage. Um, do you go for extended DARE antibiotics or do you go for you were one of your slides was about to say, where did the six weeks come from? I, I think. Um, but but that's a really, you know, useful bit in the UK because we're pretty much stuck with the six weeks or 12 weeks. Uh, and so just starting with DARE, what what would be your, you know, I know there are lots of confounders that change everything, but but what would be your kind of average duration? We would do at least six weeks. You know, Andrew, I think if you guys, uh, you should ask Matt Scarborough uh, in May when he gives that lecture. They published a beautiful paper in, um, I think it was New England Journal of Medicine, on um, the oral versus uh, IV extended versus short period. So I think there is a shift towards shortening the course of antibiotics. And there is a shift towards the use of oral versus intravenous. I think the science is definitely emerging on that front and we will see more and more emerge, but I would go short. I think six weeks is enough. A lot of people say you should put them on six months to a year. I'm not sure if that's necessary. We would just do six weeks, two weeks of it may be intravenous and four weeks oral. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that, that's very much kind of our practice as well. Um, uh, and one of the other uh, questions from the, the uh, attendees were, is, is there any role of antibiotic loaded suture in primary surgery? No, there is no antibiotic loaded suture. There's antimicrobial loaded sutures. As you know, they're called triclosan. And the CDC recommendation is for the use of triclosan impregnated sutures in contaminated surgery, such as colorectal. There is a lot published on colorectal. The person who's asking this question could potentially turn around and say, well, what about infected cases? Aren't they contaminated? The answer is yes, probably. If you were to justify the use of triclosan impregnated sutures, I think that would be cases of an infected joint, but not routinely, no. no that's really helpful. Good. Um, another quick question, Jay. Um, you mentioned uh, iodine washouts. Uh, is the iodine you're using sterile? Is it aqueous? Is it alcoholic? Yeah, so I'm a little conflicted here. So I'll, I, I hope you will all forgive me, but I've been using uh, povidine iodine for the last 12 to 13 years. I'm a believer in antiseptic solution, and I believe povidine iodine has the best track record. But we had the same issues. There was no sterile povidine iodine in the United uh, States. And the povidine iodine that's in those bottles that sit on the side of the OR, they're definitely not a sterile. I wouldn't use those and I would not pour them into uh, patients' wounds. 
they can harbor organism like uh, uh, Pseudomonas, Burkholderi sapaci, and some of these gram negatives can actually survive in that environment. So sterile betadine has become a real problem in the U US, but recently we were able to uh, file a patent and develop a technique that allows gamma sterilization of dilute povidine iodine, because it's very difficult to gamma sterilize povidine iodine, it loses its act activity. So we were able to do that. And that particular product was FDA approved recently, and it will be launched in May. And the company that's launching it hopefully will also spread it across U U U US, uh, uh, across Europe, including UK. I think we've got time for one more question because I'm, I'm very conscious that Jay, you've been talking for almost a solid hour and uh, you'll have no voice left if we keep going. It's my, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm enjoying the questions. Thank you. Very kind. So there's a question from, uh, I think from Pedro in, in uh, Fugue, one of our good colleagues. He's got a patient who's immune compromised uh, with a very well integrated implant. What are your thoughts about in sled cases doing a partial revision? It's well integrated, leaving one part behind, exchanging the easy bits, just to make it a simpler operation for the patient. And if you did so, would you then prolong your antibiotic prophylaxis or therapy rather? Yeah, I am I'm guilty of doing that. Uh, so-called a subradical resection. I will not advocate for that in, uh, in routine circumstance. I'm sure you would both agree that's not a good idea. But the circumstance that Pedro is describing is not that common, but it is a very challenging situation because you have a well-integrated stem that goes all the way down to the knee, for example, removal of which would compromise further reconstruction down the line would lead to severe uh, morbidity of the patient. The list goes on. In that sort of a circumstance, let's say if you've got a mega prosthesis, I would remove the body. I would scrub that implant surface with chlorhexidine, betadine, with everything else that's in my hand. I would then either assemble the body, a new body, or sterilize that body and then reassemble it. Or if you're going to be doing a spacer, I would leave that part and come back at a later date and reassemble. And I think that's actually justified. It is the right thing to do for the patient. Uh, you have to accept that that might carry slightly higher rate of failure, although that hasn't been reflected in the literature. Professor Ku from Korea wrote a paper. Adolf Lombardi has a paper on subradical resection. It was a question that if you guys remember, we discussed during the consensus. So there is criteria and those criteria have to be stuck to because you know, you can't just keep pushing the envelope saying, oh, you know, I don't want to take this um, well-fixed uh, small stem. I just don't have time. Uh, that type of stuff is unjustified. I still think that bio burden reduction is a very important part of your surgery. But in circumstances where removal of an implant is going to lead to severe morbidity for the patient and or compromise future reconstruction of that particular bone, I think it's justified. Yes, in that circumstance, I would extend the antibiotics. I would probably also consider actually covering them dual antibiotics, particularly if on NGS signal, I see polymicrobial, to your point earlier, Ridian, I would cover uh, both gram negative and gram positive. Yeah, great question. But I really, and I know the person who's asking Pedro, I know Pedro obviously is asking that question with the purest of uh, intentions. And we all want to do what's right for our patients. But I just don't want this answer to be misconstrued as, oh, yeah, it's acceptable to leave some stuff behind. I think that's yeah. really, I think that's, those are really wise words. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a, um, an option of laziness. It's a, an option of, of doing the best for the, for the patient. Um, so according to the, the magic clock that I've got, it is now nine o'clock. Uh, and we have borrowed... <laughs> so there's a time lag to Cardiff of about eight years. Um, so so really a little bit behind. Um, but but I'll hand back over to to Ridian to to sum everything up uh, to thank you and then to put up uh, the final uh, Dave to put up the final uh, advert or promotion. So um, once again, Jay, you've been a, a complete star, giving up your time for this a talk that's covered diagnostics in 
not just a standard way that we all think about it, but giving new research, new opportunities. Um, I think diagnosis is often the hardest thing of what we do. The treatment's easy in comparison. Um, so we are still got a lot to learn. We still have a lot of research to do. And I think it's so good seeing the collaborative work you're doing with institutes across the states. And likewise in the UK now with Badger, UK PGI, Revision Networks, collaboration is the way forward, I believe. And we would love to have you back in the UK. And for those for the delegates listening, be away in Scotland this year. We're hoping that Jay will be one of our guest speakers. Uh, we've got to make sure that uh, it's COVID, he's COVID safe. Uh, very important man, we've got to look after him. Uh, but Jay, you've been a star and I thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much, Ridian and Andrew. Thank you, Dave, as well. Thank you all for attending. I cannot wait to uh, raise a glass of wine or actually even better, a beer in, uh, in England uh, or United Kingdom very soon. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Jay. And ladies, we all the best. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Jay. You. Dave, so if there's any follow-up questions or anything you need from me, just please reach out to me by email and I'll be happy to provide anything you guys need. And Hello. have a fantastic day and good evening. Everyone, thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. So if you'd encourage uh, all the uh, delegates to stay online, we've got a few more questions we'd love you to participate in, and then we'll tell you when the next session is going to be for uh, our next webinar. So radiology. Is suspected PGI? Should plain x-rays be performed in all cases? Plain x-rays in all cases, yes or no? In suspected PGI, is there a routine role for MRI, CT, or nuclear imaging? Yes or no? And we'll give you 15 seconds to answer that. And Andrew, is, Tom has kindly offered to answer all the questions that Jay didn't get around to. Most of them, most of them involve uh, recommending that you look at the ICM fully outputs because uh, uh, this is something like a 500 page document and I I must admit um, uh, and really knows this when we came back I went through every single question that was discussed and uh, wrote the key take-home messages uh, which is exhausting because there is so much stuff there I can't can't recommend it high enough you know really it's everything you ever wanted to know about infection written there in in one document I would recommend you don't read it all at once, just dip in and out. I'm still doing it. Uh, so David, answers please to those questions. So yes, routine radiology, I, I'd fully agree. Uh, plain radiology is an excellent way of starting off your diagnostic uh, trail. Uh, and yes, uh, or rather no, the majority of you do not think MRI, CT or nuclear imaging has a routine role in infection. Very good. Andrew, do you want to take the next two questions? Yeah, so the next one is about sampling prior to surgery, uh, and and th this is this is something that again, that again um, is very clear. Um, so it would be worthwhile getting the algorithm from uh, from Jay because it, again he's very clear on on what we should be doing with this. Uh, and the question is, do you routinely get preoperative microbiological samples uh, for all infected re revisions, e.g. a joint aspirate? Yes or no. So in all re infected revisions, do you routinely get preoperative uh, microbiology? And then the question that, that follows on from that is, in, in, if the answer is yes, then do you do aspiration, uh, biopsy or aspiration and biopsy? So do you do aspiration, biopsy or aspiration and biopsy? Right, do we have the answers for those questions, Dave? Brilliant. So on the poll results, I hope you can all see that. 90% uh, of people get in uh, pre-op workup for infected revisions. Uh, and it is, it, as Jay said, you know, the great thing um, that we really need to do is focus on appropriate antibiotics for appropriate bug. Um, so, so that's a key bit is getting that pre-op workup. And uh, most people do an aspiration, um, and if uh, and 32% do an aspiration and biopsy. Um, so just from some recent work that we've done, um, 
if your aspiration is positive, then that's great. If you do aspiration and biopsy together, um, then you get another 30% um, of extra information. So we looked at all of the cases that we had done uh, over a two year period and aspiration um, uh, alone uh, gave us a certain amount of information. But when you added in the biopsy and another third of cases, it helped clarify the diagnosis. And, and I think the reason why biopsy is, is done less frequently is, is a logistical one um, in that we generally do it in, in a theatre um, rather than um, in uh, a clean, sterile room. Uh, back over to you, Rid. Great. Is there one more question, David? Here we go. Yeah, we go. So, do, so, yeah. so synovial testing, do you diagnose, use, sorry, do you use diagnostic synovial tests routinely? So synovial testing routinely, yes or no? And if so, which diagnostic synovial tests do you use? Oh, so the examples we've given you, lateral flow alpha defensin, that's point of care alpha defensin, not laboratory, lab-based alpha defensin, calprotectin, synovial CRP, other synovial white cells. So you can select as many as you want from the second question. And there are still questions coming in. Uh, and Andy, are you happy to answer as many of the questions that come through as we can? Yeah, yeah. I was I was starting at the top and working down, but um, it's going to take me quite a time, I suspect. Oh, we, so could you do it, do it live? Do it now. Uh, so, uh, go on then. Uh, working at the top, uh, unanswered questions are... When the point calculation is inconclusive, one has to rely on clinical impression. Ambiguity still exists. How do you make that more objective? Uh, yeah, so the question is, if you're doing a scoring system and you want to get a six and you score a four or a five, I yeah. think, you know, it, it, there's nothing more harm in repeating tests, especially apart, or use your acumen. I mean, the difference it's going to make is whether you're going to do one stage or two stage. And unless the patient's an extremist, my advice would be wait, maybe repeat the tests, repeat your aspiration, repeat your CRPs, and then you may get the answer you want. Um, obviously, if you do a one-stage operation, it's slightly less important. But if it's going to make a difference, then I'd wait and see. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree with you entirely on, on that, um, uh, Rid. The next one down was, um, if you want to use some criteria, uh, which ones would you choose? And I think we've probably dealt with that question because it was quite clear that the majority of people were using the 2018 criteria, um, which is reassuring considering the difficulties some UK centres have with some of those um, tests. Great. Do you have the answers to the last poll questions? There we go. So, ooh, uh, yes and no to synovial testing. I think that speaks a lot about, I think, infrastructure uh, and how the lab, labs can and can't help you. And maybe that speaks to the need for MDTs and engagement with the labs and the microbiologists, who are really the gatekeepers to these tests, I think. Uh, lateral flow of a defense in, point of care. And obviously that's within our control, but there's a cost issue. Um, People have said other, I'm guessing that might be synovial white cell counts. Uh, certainly would be my other one. Uh, and CRP scoring well. Okay, so uh, back to the questions. Uh, so um, what other enrichment techniques um, do you use for enhanced culture result? Um, uh, Rid, have you got a tame microbiologist on the, on the line? Um, uh, <laughs> That might, sure. be, that might be a good question for, for but, next time. Uh, yeah. with, with Matt Scarborough's with us. But, but I think, again, it, it talks to MDT. You know, you should be doing MDT before you do the operation. You should be discussing this with a microbiologist so they are expecting the samples and they've given you a steer on everything, including the cultures. Yeah, uh, and, and I, think, I think that is really one of the keys that... Um, that everybody's really benefited from over the last couple of years is the increase in interaction between microbiologists and um, orthopaedic surgeons. Um, okay. uh, and 
uh, for, for lots of the questions. Um, many of these topics were grappled with, with the evidence um, on the ICM uh, consensus meeting. And I would really, uh, again, recommend getting the app um, and, and using it. It's just packed full with knowledge. And if you, if you type in your question, you'll probably end up get, getting the answer. It really is, it really is that useful. Uh, and I would also take this chance to promote the BOA, BOA standards on uh, pathetic joint infection, which have recently been published. It's they're on the BOA website and you can access them from all over the world. And it's what we're promoting in the UK as a pragmatic guide to the basics you need for managing PGI. I think, unless anybody seriously objects, we've done close on an hour and a quarter now of, I think, good educational material. There's still lots of questions, but maybe you should bring people back to the next webinar when a lot of the questions repeat themselves and we can go into more depth with a microbiologist on board. We just got the last poll is, is okay. completing now. Um, if you can see that, ready in. I can't. Go ahead. Let's see it up again. There we are. So the, we've got the advertisement for the next uh, meeting, 27th of May. Do we want to do one more question before we go? One more poll? This is the last poll that has been running here. It's just about to, you'll see the, the, the results coming up shortly. So do you send tissue samples for culture from outer vision? Yes, I think that's a very clear message. When you send interoperative samples, how many do you send? Five. I, I think that's a mainstay for everybody's practices these days. Um, I, 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 I think that's uh, in, entirely right. And there's a really useful um, message just to end on. For, for those people who are only sending samples when they are suspicious for infection, um, uh, you need to look at what uh, the rest of your colleagues are doing um, and and you need to send tissue samples from every revision because if if Jay is saying that that, that forty percent of his cases are culture negative um, from from the pre-op workup then then trying to prove infection is difficult and the more samples uh, the more regularly you can send samples and the more regularly you can send five samples is is definitely the right way to go and the key is always going to be your interoperative samples at the time of your debrief so yeah your your culture rates go up if you take that membrane sample from behind the implant at the time of your revision i think Okay, gentlemen, I think we have come to the end of a, a webinar. I'd like to thank um, Andrew. I'm sure you'd like to thank me. <laughs> but mostly I'd love to thank uh, David Shields, who David has been the, uh, the brains on the brawn behind this webinar and an awful lot of work behind the scenes that's gone on. So David Shields, thank you ever so much for your help tonight. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully we will see you all for the Martin and Matt show on the 27th of May. Uh, David, how do we link into that one? The link is in the chat a couple of times. So, and, and, if not, and for all those questions that aren't answered, we will um, take those off and um, uh, address them and try and um, uh, email those round um, with your link to the next, next session. Excellent. Thank you very much. Everyone for all, for all your time, and we will uh, see you on the 27th of May. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay.